It's interesting that all four Gospels, out of all four Gospels, only two of them, Matthew and Luke, speak of the birth of Jesus. This was strange to me. You would think that all four of them would dive right into the very birth, the supernatural birth of Jesus. Um, Some would say John did it because in the very first chapter he says the word became flesh. That's as close as he's going to get. He wraps it all up, the whole birth of Jesus Christ in that one phrase, the word became flesh, and he goes on uh, to the next thing. But only two spend time in depth on the birth of Jesus. One spends time, the book of Luke, um, dealing with the, through the eyes of Mary, who we'll spend time talking about today, but also in the book of Matthew, Matthew found it important to spend uh, the first part of his writings describing the, the, the birth of Jesus Christ through the eyes of Joseph. Um, So we'll talk about that. Luke is covering Mary's end of it. Matthew is covering Joseph's end of it so that we can get both perspectives because in the in the span of time, uh, both Mary and Joseph were selected by God himself uh, for their character, uh, for their position, for who God knew that they were. Uh, He had a specific purpose for them and and they were willing to uh, to to submit to that purpose even if they couldn't fully understand what they were being told and we learned through this uh, th- th- these chapters in Luke and Matthew how that God goes to great lengths to give them assurances by sending a supernatural being the the actual angel of the Lord uh, unto both uh, Mary and Joseph to talk about and confirm with them what it is as the will of God upon their lives. And yet these individuals, these young people, we have to remember these were extremely young people. As I was studying, it said that um, typically when a young woman in the biblical days in Jewish custom, a, a young woman, when, did, when could she actually or her family start looking for her to gain a husband? Or when would they start looking to match her with another husband? Is when they believed that she became um, uh, physically mature. And that was at the age of 13. 13, we, that we would be aghast at that now. But back then, 13 years of age, they're, they're ready to look for a husband for these girls. And, you know, the interesting part about... Um, the, the engagement period in the Jewish days is it went through three different periods or three different times um, that, you know, in the course of over a year where, you know, it wasn't just a ceremony. You got married and that was it. You, you had an engagement period and a betrothal period, and then you actually had the marriage. And we're going to talk about that uh, early on in the, in the scriptures today because it's important to know that how all that plays in the role and all the overall, overall uh, supernatural story of the virgin birth. But in the book of Luke, Luke here is a Gentile writer. He's a, he's a physician, has his time with Paul, and he gets a lot of his information uh, from eyewitnesses uh, uh, that, that walked with Jesus. And the Holy Spirit pours into Luke about the virgin birth and the events thereof. And in the very first chapter of Luke, he actually spends time where talking about how that the angel Gabriel went to John the Baptist's mother and father, Elizabeth and Zacharias, and told them that they would have a son in their old age. Remember that story? And it was very important for all of us, the readers, to know that Gabriel first went to the forerunner, to the parents of the forerunner of Christ, and said, you are going to have a supernatural birth of your own right. It's not going to be a virgin birth, but it's going to be a birth of, uh, that, that's supernatural because you're past the age of giving birth. And we know the story how that uh, Zacharias wouldn't believe it, and they went uh, mute uh, for, for the, uh, the whole time that, the, that, that Elizabeth was, was, was pregnant. But the, Gab- the angel Gabriel went to Elizabeth and told her that she would conceive and give forth a great son who would be the forerunner of the, of the Messiah. So what Elizabeth did not know is that a cousin of hers that lived some ways away was going to be um, approached by the same angel only six months later. So you got Elizabeth who's six months pregnant. And in the 26th chapter of Luke is where we enter into our lesson text today. And it says, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, we are very familiar with Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazarenes. We are very familiar with it. But did you know that the Old Testament never mentions Nazareth? 
Nowhere in the Old Testament is the city of Nazareth mentioned at all. Uh, it's only mentioned here in the New Testament. Even the old writings of Josephus and all of those other secular writings that we, we try to learn history from never mentioned Nazareth. It was a very, very small community. Uh, it, and it kind of put it in a, in, a, in a point of reference around here. In, this, in the state of Galilee, which Old Testament prophecies did teach that the Messiah would spend time in Galilee, which was a region, uh, you might have multiple cities and towns in that Galilee area. It'd be similar, Nazareth would be similar to what we would see if we had High Point, Greensboro, and Winston, and Thomasville, and Lexington. Denton would be Nazareth. You know, 1,200, 1,500 people down in Denton. It's a, it's a, it's a town, but it's very uh, obscure. And Nazareth is that in, in Galilee. So you would certainly never think of an angel going there and finding someone that he needs to deliver a message too, but it's very important for us, the reader, to realize that not only is, does this point to the character of Mary, that even in a small, obscure town uh, where they only have one water well or well for, for wa drinking water and everybody in the town had to go to that same well, not only in that small, obscure town, you still have a, a young, obscure woman who has the character traits that God above has found to be highly favored. And instead of God saying, no, I mean, that's, very, that's great, Mary, she's highly favored, but it's got to come out of Jerusalem and the hierarchy, the aristocracy of, the, of Judaism. And, the, you know, everyone is looking for the Messiah to come out of the aristocracy. You know, certainly his mother would come uh, out of the, the wealth of Jerusalem. But no, it's coming out of a small, obscure town called Nazareth. And the Ga Gabriel is sent to God, from God to this city to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. He was in the lineage of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Mary is the Hebrew word meaning exalted one. So espoused to a man named Joseph. So Gabriel was sent to a young woman in her teens, most likely, who's got high, high credibility, high qualities. He's sent there and she's already prepared to marry a man named Joseph. Now, when it says she's espoused, she's already gone through two of the three processes of full marriage. In other words, you have an engagement period where your parents get together. The parents of Mary would get with the parents of Joseph, and they would talk to one another, and they would say, okay, we, we like your son, or we like your daughter, we think that would be a great match, and they put together the format of how that they are going to match their children together. This is who we believe and we find favor that you're going to be uh, married in, uh, to each other. So that's the engagement period. But then the betrothal period, which is where it's espoused, is a ceremony that the husband or the, the future husband and wife come together and they actually make the statements to each other, committing the oneself to the other, saying that we have agreed that we will be married uh, forever together and we make our vows together right here at this time. Well, you would think in today's world that meant so once, you, once you make your vows to one another, it's, you know, you're married and you go live together. Well, they wasn't back then. You made your vows, and that way it's your betrothal period, but you're, you're then classified as being espoused to each other. But you couldn't be with each other physically for a year. You couldn't live together for a year. You were only married by ceremony. But after the year-long period of your betrothal period, you would come together and have a great marriage. Now, the interesting part about the, the, the marriage is that uh, the ceremony of the marriage is that the bridegroom, I found this would be interesting, the bridegroom would not come back on a specific day that everyone knew. He would come at a day and a time of his choosing to take his bride unexpectedly. Now, think about that. The bridegroom would come and take his bride unexpectedly. So the bride was always looking for the bridegroom. What does that sound like with the church? It was always looking for the bridegroom to come. Always prepared for the bridegroom to show up at any second. Every day she was prepared for her bridegroom to show up and say, today's the day. Now, of course, they would see each other through the, through the year. But it was the dime that he had established, today is the day when I'm going to um, 
take, we're, we're going to finalize this marriage and we're going to consummate our marriage. So they're, they're in the betrothal period, Mary and Joseph is, when Gabriel arrives to talk to Mary. So she's already, um, you know, getting ready to, she's looking for her bridegroom, so, so to speak. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. That's high praise given to a teenage girl, a, an angelic being coming into her home or wherever she was at at this particular moment. You can imagine the fear that came upon her and then to hear such words of praise for a girl growing up in Nazareth. If she was the hierarchy in Jerusalem and someone would say that, you know, she'd probably say, oh, I hear that all the time. But in Nazareth, Mary has never heard such salutations as this. So it scares her because in 29, it says, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. What, are you, what he's saying there and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. God has seen you. He has noticed you. He knows your character. And he has chosen you out of that favor that he has. He's chosen you for a purpose. And behold, here's the purpose. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. Now, Jesus in the Hebrew means the Lord saves. Now, if you're Mary, she's hearing this, knowing that her bridegroom hasn't come fully yet. She's never physically been with her bridegroom. And by hearing the words of what the Gabriel is saying, she is assuming, rightly so, that this is going to take place pretty soon, if not immediately. She's going to conceive in her womb and shall give forth a son, and she's going to call his name Jesus. But he didn't stop there. He says, he, Jesus, shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. Now, Mary knew enough, and this tells us a little bit about Mary's knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures and things of this nature. Because she knew that anyone that would be called son of the highest is indicative of divinity. That is a divine nature. That's a divine title. So here, not only is this angel telling her that you're going to conceive in your womb, and I'm going to tell you that you're going to have a son, and here's the reason that you name him Jesus. She knows that his name uh, most likely means salvation, and that he's going to be the son of the highest. Now she's thinking back, she's probably thinking in her mind, now how is Joseph going to do this? The divine one. And she doesn't understand it. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. We don't know much about Mary. We don't know if she was looking for the Messiah as much as all uh, the, the uh, Jewish people were back during these days. We don't know how much she had studied in his coming and, and read the prophecies. We assume that what the, the angel of the Lord is telling her is resonating somewhat because she can sense the supernatural part of this. She can sense that the attributes he is speaking of this child that she's going to conceive is just in a divine nature and very supernatural. And she is confused by it, trying to figure out how it was, how it's going to be. But she also knows when he makes uh, terms such as his kingdom, there shall be no end. He shall reign over the house of Jacob. These are all attributes attributed to the Messiah that come in the Messiah. And here's this young teenager thinking this is incredible. We don't know how she re reacted to it. We, we know that she was fearful at first. But when you have a supernatural angelic being making these statements to you, it certainly causes some questions. Now, it's interesting. Our lesson text doesn't get into her response, but I'm going to read it because I figure that it's important. We're talking about the virgin uh, conceives, and we want to know what the virgin has to say to the angel. So in verse 34... Says, Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be? Now, Zacharias said the same thing when Gabriel went and told him that his wife of old age is going to give birth to John, going to call his name John. He's going to be the forerunner of Christ. But Zacharias said the same thing and, and they shut his lips. He was mute. He said it out of unbelief. Mary is saying this out of. Um, 
confusion and how that biologically this could take place. How can this be? Because I know not a man. I am a virgin. I, I am betrothed to a man, but we are not to be together until it's his time to come. Maybe she was thinking that the bridegroom was going to come. You know, maybe this is indicative of when uh, Joseph, the, the angel knows the day that Joseph is going to come and take me for his own. And, and this is when all of this is going to take place. Maybe I'm getting a heads up on when my bridegroom is coming. So she's asking, how shall this be? The answer is even more supernatural. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest, that's divine, that's God, the power of God shall overshadow thee. Overshadow thee. That doesn't mean overcome thee. This is not a forcible thing. This is not something where God is just going to uh, and, you know, uh, forcibly do something. Overshadow is indicative of a cloud, being surrounded by a cloud. And interestingly enough, of like his Shekinah glory, when he would come down into the tabernacle over the Ark of the Covenant, he would enshroud the tabernacle with his cloud. You remember when Moses went to, the, to Sinai and the cloud came down, and when Moses came down from being in the presence of God, his face shone. You know, something happens to mankind when they're in the cloud. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration. When Jesus goes up to the mountain. Uh, Peter, James, and John are watching them transform themselves when the cloud comes down. This is what they're saying. This is what the angel was saying to Mary. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the whole highest shall overshadow thee. He's going to wrap himself and enclose you in his Shekinah glory. Therefore, also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. He is telling her it's not going to come from Joseph. This is not going to be a natural birth. This is not going to be a birth that you're, you, you know, you may have thought we were, we're giving you a, a heads up on when Joseph is coming. No, Joseph is not going to do this. This is from the Holy Spirit through a complete uh, transfiguration when he comes upon you and envelops you in his cloud that he is going to implant this holy seed inside of you. And behold, Thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. The interesting part is the angel felt it was important to not only tell Mary, how this was going to happen. It wasn't going to happen through natural means. He also wanted to confirm that God can do anything. If you want to believe me, go visit your, your cousin Elizabeth, who in old age and was classified as barren, is already six months pregnant. Letting her know that I have, you know, I have already spoken to Elizabeth. God has already sent a child into her. And, you know, uh, this, is, this gives Mary an opportunity to say, well, let me go down and visit my cousin Elizabeth. And when they do go down there, when she does go down there to visit, of course, we know how the story goes where she walks in, Elizabeth six months pregnant, and the baby leaps inside of her when she just walks into the room because the baby understands. The baby in its infancy there is still in its embryonic state, I guess. It's, it leaps inside of her, knowing automatically that the mother of the, child, of, the, of, of the Messiah has walked into the room, the mother who has accepted the task. That's the beauty of Mary. That's what we learn from Mary. Most, most people would say, this is ridiculous. You know, I, I know you're an angelic being. I know you're from, not from around here. And I know that, you know, that this is, uh, you know, you're certainly not someone that I should take lightly. But this is physically impossible. Therefore, I can't believe it. Mary doesn't. She says, be it unto me. Whatever the Lord's will unto me, even in this supernatural way, I'm willing to take it on. We have no idea if she knew the enormity of what was about to take place. But she was willing, had a willing heart. So we've got a virgin here that is going to conceive of a son, going to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who's too old to have a son, who's already six months pregnant. This thing is moving in a direction that God has intended for millennia and is coming to pass. Now, when Elizabeth... 
and Mary get together, and it says, And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste in the city of Judea, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. All kind of things happening here. And she spake out with a loud voice to Mary and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, this is quite uh, a confirmation that Mary is receiving. Not only is it heavy in her heart that she's received this incredible supernatural uh, statement from the angel, but now she's receiving confirmation from her cousin whom she trusts, and it builds her faith. And with that, she stays with her for a while. Now, the interesting part is that while she's there with them, they build on each other. They support each other. They encourage one another because these two women are going to have probably two of the most important, uh, well, without a doubt, the most important children uh, in the New Testament. No doubt, Jesus, of course, is the greatest of all, but John the Baptist, the forerunner, Jesus himself will mention seeing high praises about John. And these two women, these two cousins are about to produce them through the Holy Spirit. And Mary, in, in, in verse 46, she has a statement there that says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. It's a very important statement that Mary is making here, because, as I said earlier when we talked about how that some, uh, some religious organizations like to worship Mary, and some have even gotten to the point where they considered Mary to be uh, sinless. Uh, there is a um, immaculate uh, conception where uh, certain organizations believe that even though Mary was born of a natural means, that God would not allow Mary to be tainted by sin. So therefore, in her conception, unlike all of other mankind, she was not born into sin because they could not accept the fact, these religious organizations could not accept the fact that Mary could give birth to the perfect Jesus if she wasn't perfect herself. But this is not what Scripture teaches us. Scripture teaches us that Joseph was, the seed of Joseph was the one that, the, 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 the Adamic nature, our sinful nature, comes through the seed of the father, through the seed of the man, and therefore that's why Joseph was going to have nothing to do with the birth of Jesus. But uh, in this statement that Mary makes, she is acknowledging to all those that would come after her that would try to give her um, divine, divine status. She is saying that my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, meaning she recognize her, recognizes her own sinfulness. You don't need a Savior if you're not a sinful creature. If you don't need saving, you don't need a Savior. She is acknowledging in her salutation, in her song of praise, with Elizabeth, she is telling Elizabeth, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I am in need of a Savior. I am an imperfect being, and I rejoice in the fact of God and my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Once again you're seeing the character of Mary at a young age, how she received this message. She was willing to accept it. She was willing to take on whatever her future held because she trusted in her Lord, Lord, her Savior. She knew that she could trust in him, and no matter what this may happen to her life, she knew enough about the importance of it, and it tells you about her faith. She said, from, from now on, every generation will call me blessed because of what I'm about to give birth to, which is of the Holy Ghost, she knew the importance of what was about to happen, and she was willing to take it on. So when we get to the, the eyes of, through the eyes of Mary, how that Luke has, has expressed to us that, you know, this, this is who we know. We don't know much about Mary, but this is what we know from her reaction, that she was one that was certainly highly favored by God for her, for her character. But we don't know much about Joseph at all except for the book of Matthew. And, and even after Matthew, after the uh, gospel of Matthew talks about Joseph and what we're about to speak on, we don't know much about Joseph after um, the, the Jesus, uh, 
the age when he's about 12 years old and he's, he, 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 they're in the city of Jerusalem and he gets away from his mom and dad and they're angry and they find him in the temple teaching. and all. That's the last time we hear of Joseph is when Jesus is about 12 years old. It's assumed because she was, um, she was at the cross listed as one of the widows at the cross that Joseph will die, die early most likely as, a, as a, when Jesus is still a young man. Uh, but we lose uh, track of, of whatever happened to Joseph after Jesus is tw- uh, when he was a young, young boy. But this is going to tell us a little bit about Joseph because he's got a play in this as well. Matthew it starts with the 18th verse because verses 1 through 17, Matthew, who is writing his gospel solely for the Jewish people, the Jewish reader. He is writing his gospel for the Jews that will be reading his gospel because the Jews know that the Messiah needs to come out of the lineage of David. That's what the Old Testament prophets had prophesied. And Matthew is going to give them the proof that the birth of Jesus Christ did come out of the lineage of David. And so the, ver- the very first 17 verses of this chapter, he is telling about all the lineages all the way down through the ages and how that Joseph is going to come out of King David's lineage. So in the 18th verse, he expands and he gets into the, to the actual uh, birth by saying, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise or as follows. Here, here's, here's the birth of Jesus Christ. This is how it was. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. It happened. She was, she's pregnant. She had been visiting her, her cousin Elizabeth. We don't know how long she stayed with her, but when she came back to um, Nazareth, Joseph sees her. He knew she was visiting Judah or Judea, and uh, he, she, he, she comes back and she looks different. <laughs> If you're the spouse husband and your spouse wife comes back from a visit with her cousin and she looks a little heavier, you're you're starting to worry. She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Put her away. When you are betrothed to someone, when you're espoused to someone, that you are legally together. You haven't been together physically. You don't live together for that one-year period. But you're legally married to each other. And therefore, the only way to be unbetrothed is through a divorce procedure. And you can do it publicly if something that your, your spouse has done that is, has been humiliating to you or whatever. You can do it publicly or you can do it privately whatever you choose to do. So here comes Mary back in town, and she apparently uh, is, is, is showing. And so Joseph, who is probably uh, dumbfounded at this time, not sure why uh, he wasn't told by Mary up front, but you know, we're going to get to that here. Joseph sees her, and the first thing he's going to say is, my betrothed has been unfaithful to me while she was visiting her cousin Elizabeth, but... I'm not going to make a public spectacle out of her. I'm going to do this thing privately. I'm going to put her away where she can have the child, and it's not its not going to look back on her family, on her, or whatever. It shows a little bit of his character as well. But while he thought on these things, while he was planning this, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. This is how the angel of the Lord goes to Joseph. It's in a dream, and it says, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That's what Joseph is being told. This is all planned. It's purpose. You have been chosen. Not only has your wife Mary been chosen above all women, but you have been chosen because of your own character to take her upon you and to help her as she raises this blessed son. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Joseph is out of the lineage of David. He knows that the Messiah is going to come out of the lineage of David. He certainly didn't think it would come out of anything that out of line of his, but he is seeing that when, when the angel says you shall call his name, Jesus, he knows that that means the Lord saves for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, 
which being interpreted is God with us. The virgin conceives. We see the story. Here again, as I said earlier, we're not sure why all four Gospels don't expound on the virgin birth. But we're thankful for the, for the books of Luke and Matthew who did see through the Holy Spirit the, uh, the, the direction that it needed to express to us because without a doubt you cannot be saved from the blood of an imperfect being. Jesus was, he was that perfect being and he had to come in a perfect manner. He could not be tainted. Therefore, if we do not believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, we cannot fully believe that the blood he shed is pure enough to cover our sins. He has to have been born uh, by the Virgin Mary, and, and Luke tells us what she went through, how she was uh, um, exposed to the, uh, to the angel, and how, what she was told by him, and she believed him, accepted her fate. Her whole life would be changed at that point. Any plans that she may have had as a young teenage girl were most likely over, and she knew it, but accepted it, not knowing what was coming her way. She knew it would be great. She knew what she was about to, to deliver was going to be the, uh, the great son of the highest. Now, you, I can't imagine what a teenage girl would think this would mean, but yet she accepted that and lived up to it, and, and Joseph himself... The very one that could have easily said, I've waited for you. I did everything right, and here you are showing up pregnant. I'm going to put you away privately. He gets visited by an angel in a dream. He could have easily said, I dreamed this. This was crazy. I ain't going to do it. The reality is she's pregnant. She's here. It's not mine. It's over. I'm, I'm going to go and get a woman who's, who's faithful to me. You can imagine all the things that Joseph could have said, but yet... There's a reason that God selects the people that he selects. He knew that they would receive and accept what the Holy Spirit had told them what they, through the angel. We are thankful for what these individuals, these, these imperfect human beings, did by accepting their fate, by accepting this magnificent gift to them. But yet did we also learn a lesson that they were as common as we are common. They were not of a hierarchy. They were not of a supernatural sort. They were not superhuman. They were as common as we are today. We can do great things if, the God, if God wants to use us for whatever purpose. When we're asked to do things and we look ahead at all the things that this may cause in my life, all the disruptions, if I'm asked to do something that seems crazy or overwhelming, and this is going to change everything in my life, if God is in it, if he has picked you for a specific purpose, trust in him. We learn from Mary and Joseph. Trust in him and what his plans for you are. Accept your fate in his, in his hands, and he will take care of us. Next week, as we continue to go in leading up to the Christmas season, our Savior has come. Next week, the birth. So we'll come back to you.